Okay, good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for the organizing committee and inviting me and giving me this opportunity. So, uh, so the talk that I'm going to talk about today is relatively new subject that uh, combining uh, in vivo isotope labeling with mass spec imaging. So this is a relatively new work. Uh, so. So, in, uh, so we have been working on mass spec imaging of a plant metabolites for 15 years. So I'll show you some of the examples about some old uh, data uh, so that you have some idea of how, what you can do with mass spec imaging, especially for Sensitive. Okay. Uh so for you know, this one example is a uh, long time ago. So uh, if, if you think about wax lipid, like a C29 arcane, it doesn't have any functional groups. In general, there's no way we can see in the mass spec. But if you are using colloidal silver as a matrix, then you can make an adduct because silver has a, a good affinity to hit arcane chain. Then you can even see those uh, non-functional groups with the mass spec imaging, in this case with 12 micron high spatial resolution. And this is one of the work also uh, quite a bit ago using five micron resolution and cryosectioning uh, image of a major leaf. As you can see, uh, each different metabolites are showing up totally different localizations. So like flavonoids are only epidermal cells because they are protecting from the UV while those uh, crop lipids are uh, right around the vesicular bundles in photosynthetic cells. One thing most interesting is these compounds, HMBOA glucose and DIMBOA glucose, they are um, insect repellent and they are known to be present in the mesophyll. But what we see is that they are present right in between vesicular bundles, not all mesophyll. So if you are selecting each single cell with laser micro dissection, then you cannot differentiate, differentiate those differences. So that is possible only if you do direct analysis from the tissue. And so uh, we can do even uh, um, um, uh, MS MS imaging or multiplex imaging uh, by uh, dividing each pixel into smaller pixels. So, for example, uh, we, with even accurate mass, you cannot differentiate temporal hexode and quercetin ram node, they have exact same mass. But if you do MS, MS imaging from temporal fragment, you can tell temporal hexodes are upper part of the period while looking at quercetin fragment, you can see quercetin ram nodes are only in the bottom part of the period. So that's kind of thing you can do. Uh, and you can do even data dependent MS, MS while you are acquiring the mass spec imaging so that you can trace back and uh, uh, identify those compounds if you like. And you can even do cell specific localization. Uh, so this is a major leaf in case of D73. If you compare PG32-1 and PG32-0, there's only one double carbon difference. But PG32-0 is mostly on the uh, bundle shares, while PG31 is mostly mass appeared. But then if you are looking at a different genotype like MO17, they are deficient in PG31 and PG320 is mostly homogeneous. So this is the kind of thing you aspect imaging can tell you. And uh, in collaboration with Yana Ian, we found that arabidopside uh, that are known for wounding response is highly enriched in ferronium mutant. Uh, but then from five microns uh, mass spec imaging, we, we could uh, we found that they are co-localized with chlorophyll. And so that means they are mostly localized in chloroplast. And we can even uh, study plant pathogen interactions in this case uh, in collaboration with Bingyang and 
Ruben Piros, they uh, generate mutant rice that produce uh, those mammal, uh, mumilactones and phytocassins that are fighting with the bacteria. And you can see they are only localized to the infected site. And then recently, uh, so uh, there are many people in mass spec imaging community realize that uh, mass spec imaging can tell you uh, high spatial resolution, but then uh, the sensitivity is limited. So uh, on tissue chemical differentiation is becoming popular. And uh, what we propose is that uh, providing multiple, combining multiple different differentiation, hopefully we can improve the overall metabolic coverage is up to 80 and 90%. And then one of the issues in this study would be uh, data analysis. It's a huge amount of data set uh, manually uh, calculating uh, the derivatization and then looking at each image. It's a lot of work. So we collaborate with uh, Alexandru Pogorov. So now they uh, adapted this uh, chemical modification tool. So now uh, many people uh, can use and uh, for on tissue derivatization. This is a uh, this is uh, in gas cage reaction. Uh, so by uh, introducing DTO vapor into the moldy source and also using deuterated de matrix, what you can do is you can do gas phase hydrogen deuterium exchange. So what you can do with that is um, if you have some metabolites with OH and NH and SH, they can be replaced by deuterium in the gas phase. Then you can tell how many hydrogen OH group this compound had, so that you can narrow down the possible structural isomers. And uh, especially our uh, method is very effective. You can um, uh, exchange up to 17 uh, OH groups. So we can easily detect uh, and then uh, and then uh, find uh, help identification of those uh, uh, flavonoids with many OH groups. So let me switch group, uh, switch uh, the gear to the today's talk. It's about in vivo labeling with mass spec imaging. So there are the uh, fascinating work uh, published by Davino Beach and Davidson Group in Princeton recently that highlight uh, the power of aspect imaging combined with isotope labeling. So what they have done is they infuse a mouse with a isotope labeled metabolite, isotope labeled tracer, and then monitoring their uh, the, the modified metabolites and, and in mass spec imaging, they can tell in special localization of metabolic activity. So for example, when they use a certain carbon glucose as a feed, and then if you are looking at M6 UDP glucose, then you can monitor glycolysis uh, metabolism. If you are looking at, if you are using uh, glycerol as a uh, isotope tracer, and then if you monitor M3 UDP glucose, then you can monitor gluconeogenesis. So with that, they what they found in mouse uh, kidney is that uh, this glycolysis activity is mostly uh, uh, most active in modular than cortex, while uh, gluconeogenesis is mostly active in cortex in modular, completely opposite. So not only you can get where it metabolized, but we can tell exactly what metabolism is going on with the isotope labeling. So that's what uh, we are hoping to get. Uh, uh, with isotope labeling uh, with the mass spec imaging, especially in our case in implant applications. So we have done uh, some of the work um, using 15 nitrogen uh, labeling. So uh, if you have a root growth, uh, it has two different nitrogen source. Nitrogen can come from the seed itself, or it can come from the external nutritional source. And there is no way you can differentiate the two. But what you can do is you can use the 15 nitrogen salt as a uh, external nutrition. Then whatever label should be coming from the nutrition, not from the seed itself. That's what we can uh, study. So for example, uh, through this study, we, we can find that glutamine is 
a highly rich enriched in uh, 15 nitrogen also as uh, as paragen of course that's not surprising they are uh, nitrogen carriers but what we find is that also arlanian is highly enriched for B773 genotypes, but not much for MO17. So what's happening is uh, MO17 uh, made, made seed has a very high abundance in amino acid. So the root does not need to uh, synthesize uh, 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 amino acid, uh, utilize 15 nitrogen nutrition as much than B73, which is low in amino acid, and then is more nitrogen mostly from uh, the outside nutrition. So that's what you can see. But then if you look at mass spec imaging, what you can tell is not only they are highly enriched, but then uh, they are special localization you can see in mass spec imaging. For example, glutamine is, uh, has a different uh, genotypic localization that uh, B73 is mostly in the piece, while MO17 is more of the homogeneous, but there's no difference between 15 nitrogen amino acids that came from uh, the seed versus 15 nitrogen labeled one from the outside. So once nitrogen is coming into the root, there is no difference between 14 nitrogen and 15 nitrogen uh, that we can demonstrate with mass spec imaging. So, the, uh, so we recently started this project, uh, combined mass spec imaging with in vivo group labeling. Uh, it has been only one or two years, so uh, it's a very early stage. <clears throat> so some of the, <clears throat> so we are trying uh, growing dogweed in D2, and we are growing Arabidopsis uh, in, in hydroponic culture with the D2 or 15 nitrogen sort. Uh, and also we are growing beige root tips with certain carbon glucose, and also labeling certain carbon uh, Arabidopsis seed uh, the, by growing silex in uh, certain carbon glucose. So we are still very early stage. Today's work will be uh, mostly focused on dog with labeling with the D2O. Uh, it's just here. Uh, we are in, in the middle of writing the papers. So it's still early work. So uh, maybe some of the things that I say may not be exactly co correct. So if you can give me some feedback, uh, I'm not a biologist by training. So that would be great. So uh, dog with, as an aqua plant, they grow very well uh, with the D2O, even up to 50% D2O. Uh, as you can see, they are a little stressed, they are a little smaller, uh, and their growth rate is a little slower than H2O, but nevertheless, they grow indefinitely. So uh, we, we can uh, grow in 50% D2O, and then we can monitor their labeling, and then see what happens. So here is just some experimental scheme. We are mostly interested in uh, uh, the chloroplast membrane lipid. So what we did is after growing uh, at various time point, and we used a sample prep, what we call a fracturing that we developed maybe like 10 years ago. So basically if you have um, a leaf and we attach to the, the duct tape, uh, the packing tape, and then we dry them and then we fold it over. So if you have the lip, both sides are attached to the lip and we pass through the uh, rolling mirror to, to give some mechanical stress. Then if you pop open, it's breaking apart right in the middle. So then the internal mesophyll layer is exposed for moldy mass spec imaging. And we use the uh, gold sputter to make sure the surface is conductive. Then we use DHB as a matrix. And we use uh, OB trap uh, uh, QE with HF uh, that had up to 24,000 mass resolution and using uh, spectrograph mold source. So here is an example of mass spectra. The top one is uh, before we move to the uh, detour uh, medium. And the most abundant uh, mass material compounds are of course, MGDG and DGDG, uh, mostly 366 and 366. And, and also we can see uh, fiopitin A. Fiopitin A is basically chlorophyll A uh, that lost magnesium in multi condition. Magnesium ion is easily lost, they are non covalent bond. And after 
A15 and 50% detour, they are almost completely labeled. And as you can see, you have this binomial distribution. Because all the CH bond in this compound, they, are, they have 50% of chains labeled with hydrogen versus deuterium. So you have this binomial distribution of all the CH bond. And for example, if you look at uh, this MGDG366, the, the mean shift is about 35 deuterium. And MGDG366 has a 70 uh, carbon bound hydrogen. So about half of them is all labeled. So it's, uh, it's very weird because uh, the, that means your deuterium labeling efficiency is nearly high to almost 100%. And in some other, most other species, uh, the deuterium labeling efficiency is very low in case of bacteria, for example, only 50%. And because of the isotope, uh, kinetic isotope effect. But in, in case of uh, dogweed, it, it may be aqua plant, it is very efficient uh, uh, labeling efficiency. So then what about if you are looking at very early days, in this case, five days. So in 15 days, they are completely grown up. But how about early days? Then we can see actually there are three isotope groups that we labeled as a group one labeling, group two labeling, and group three labeling, in this case for the MGDG36 compound that I mentioned. So group one uh, is average about three and a half labeling that corresponds to only galactose labeling. So galactose has seven carbon bound hydrogens and 50% is about 3.5. And then group two, uh, we propose each combination of one galactose and one fatty acid change, then total of 18 uh, deuterium labeling, and that's about 18 in average. And then group stage, the entire molecule, the normal synthesis, and half of the CH group is labeled. And then if you are monitoring their change over time, the X scale is time uh, and Y scale is relative abundance. So group one is showing up in the single day. Of course, galactose is very fast. Uh, uh, and group two is showing up in about group, uh, day two. And group three is showing about in day three. But then group one is maintained a uh, very long time until day 10, until they disappear. While group two had a very short intermediate and coming down. While group three is keep going up, of course, eventually everything is labeled. So if you look at DGDG, DGD is another galactose from MGDG. It's a similar pattern, except uh, we couldn't see group two, but it's simply because there is a low signal in moldy um, data. And later on, we could see it in uh, ESI. Uh, they have a similar pattern over time. Uh, but similar group pattern to group one, two, three. So our hypothesis is group one is basically there is a huge pool of unlabeled DAG that is labeled by uh, deuterated galactose and becoming labeled MGDG. That's group one. And then we hypothesize group two start from uh, unlabeled LPA as, an, as a starting point. So there must be a lot of unlabeled LPA that is labeled with fatty acid change and uh, deuterated galactose. And then of course, group three is the novel synthesis uh, that would be happening in only in new tissues. And then DGDG may have two options, either uh, adding another deuterated galactose to MGDG, making two galactose labeling, or labeling galactose to unlabeled MGDG, making uh, only one galactose labeled. And then our mass spec imaging data support our uh, hypothesis. Uh, so group one, uh, we hypothesize uh, there's a, a large pool of DAG that is labeled by deuterated galactose. Group one has the same image with, so I, I need to explain this first. So uh, on the left is optical imaging uh, of the dog with. Uh, on the right right side, the parent front, and left to our daughter front. I know the image is a little bit uh, 
that high quality, that's because they are uh, broken in the middle by fracturing. Um, so the, the, the parent front is what we actually moved to D2O. And uh, after five days, uh, you still have some uh, parent front that are of course uh, unlabeled because they were moved to uh, D2O medium. But then group one uh, has the same image with uh, unlabeled uh, MGDG. That's because uh, there, is a, there must be a large probe DAG unlabeled and there are being labeled by only galactose. And then group three is just showing up only in new tissues, the new dorsal front. That's surprising because they, are, uh, they, are, they were barely present when we moved, but then they are um, totally new tissues are grown up. But then group two has intermediate behaviors. They, can, they are present only new part of the uh, uh, parent front or uh, all the part of the new, um, all the part of the door front. So that makes sense with our hypothesis. Then also it supported by uh, only collecting uh, parent front and then uh, extracting all the lipids and injecting with the LCMS. We can see of course parent front uh, dominated by only group one and tiny bit of group two. And then door front uh, dominated by group three and tiny bit of group two that's uh, consistent with mass spec imaging data. Then how about fiofitin A? Uh, fiofitin A has the same, uh, just one uh, group, the, the entire molecule is labeled. So what that means is fiofitin uh, does not have a distinct uh, unlabeled port that are partially labeled uh, or the synthesis rate, there's no clear differentiation that we can tell with this experiment. And one thing we also found interesting is that uh, deuterium labeling efficiency is much lower for fiap a to about 80 some percent. So uh, by somehow galactolipids are much efficient uh, in, in, in their pathway of uh, reductase enzymes in deuterium labeling, while that's not the case for the uh, chlorophyll uh, synthesis. Then, then we are interested in uh, how about some other lipids? Uh, of course, in, in, in the given condition that we used, we could not see other lipids, especially we could not see phospholipid. So we uh, we relied on uh, TLC separation, just like most of the plant people do. Uh, we uh, bend TLC and then extract the band, and then we inject to uh, direct infusion into the uh, ESI mass pack. Then we can see MGDG and DGDG and fiofitin A that uh, I already talked about, but also we could see PEs and PCs. One thing interesting is, uh, uh, galactolipids are dominated by 36 carbons, while P and PC are dominated by 34 carbons. So they have a difference. So, and one thing also I, I forgot to mention that also PC and PH data analysis is very complicated because uh, they have multiple unsaturated compounds right next to each other. And they when they are deuterium labeled, then deuterium labeling versus uh, two hydrogen difference, the mass difference only about three millidaltons. So there is no way uh, we can differentiate with our mass pack. Maybe 15 Tesla or 15, 21 Tesla FTSL might. might. So in this uh, isotope uh, parent, we are not differentiating uh, number of double carbon because they're all overlapped each other. Uh, nevertheless, we can see group two and group three compounds will not show about the group one, uh, the contamination from isotope, 13 carbon isotope. So nevertheless, nevertheless, they have the same pattern of group two and group three for PC and PE. But then there was uh, those compounds that I talked about so far, it's a similar pattern, MGDG, 36, DGDG 36, PC 34, P 34. But PC 36 has a different pattern. They are much faster. So on day three, some other, um, those others, group two is dominant. 
but then group three becomes about twice in day five. But in PC36, uh, group three is already twice amount, and by day five, group two is almost gone. So that means the synthesis of PC36 must be much faster than other lipids. But then if you look at DGG343, which uh, we couldn't analyze in moldy data because so small picks, but in ESI we could see it. But now we found that they are slower than others, that even in day five, group two is more abundant. So, so that is, and then also interesting is um, DGDG366 mostly, so DGDG has two galactose groups, but only one galactose labeled mostly, while DGDG343 is two galactose labeled mostly. So there is some difference between carbon change. So how can we explain this? So um, this is our hypothesis, what's happening in dog with. Uh, this is relatively well known in uh, plant lipid uh, galactolipid biosynthesis. So there are two pathways, what they call prokaryotic pathways and eukaryotic pathways. So uh, once fatty acids are synthesized in plastid, they can continue to synthesize uh, MGDG and DGDG. That's what they call prokaryotic pathways. They can be uh, MGDG, DGDG 18 and 16. But then uh, fatty acids can be exported to ER and then synthesis can happen in ER. And this PC derived uh, uh, fatty acid can go back to uh, chloroplast that makes 1818 MGDG and DGDG. So there are two different pathways. So in case of dog with this eukaryotic, eukaryotic pathway is dominant. That's why we see mostly 1818 MGDG and DGDG. And especially this uh, PC1818 pathway must have very high flux that fast synthesized and moved over to chloroplast. That's why MGDG1818 is dominant in dog with. So of course there is some possibility that uh, uh, there might be PC1618 may contribute then we cannot uh, differentiate two as it is, but they have difference in SN1 and SN2 position. So hopefully uh, with MSMS, hopefully we can differentiate the two. So that's the next plan. And then we were interested, what about reverse labeling? So instead of uh, so far, I have shown that H2 culture dogweed and move to 50% D2. How about going back after growing dogweed for several months in the 50% D2? Now we are moving back to regular H2. And then we found there is some difference. So uh, we are using average mass as an indicator of the, the overall change. Basically, if you have isotope pattern, we are averaging the whole isotope and the average mass. So in case of H2 to 50% D2, initially this the, the average mass change is very slow, but then eventually catching up, while 50% D2 to reverse labeling, there was labeled such high uh, average mass, then going down very rapidly. And we can see the same thing between MGDG and DGDG, and there are about two days of delay between. So our hypothesis is, uh, of course, when the plant that was growing in normal condition, when it moved to DITO, there's a DITO stress response. It takes about two days to catch up uh, and, and then get used to this DITO environment. That's our hypothesis. And then uh, to confirm this behavior, we did some probocancy experiment with certain carbon labeling. So it's, it's very preliminary. Uh, so basically, uh, in this uh, early Meyer flask, uh, we have a tiny uh, uh, beaker uh, with the dog width and, and the medium. And then uh, there's another tiny beaker with the barium 13 carbonate. And, we, uh, and then we flush out this flask with uh, CO2 free air. Then we are 
uh, adding lactic acid uh, to generate 13 CO2. And then we let them grow for a couple of days. And then, so this uh, experiment is very preliminary. There are some limitations. So this uh, system is not perfect. There's some tiny bit of leak so that some 12 CO2 contamination is still present, about 10%. And but the, the purpose is compared to D2 stress that we realized that maybe it can tell you the condition without D2 stress. So first of all, we found that there are similar patterns uh, in of group one, two, three uh, compounds in, uh, in, this, in this certain carbon labeling. And this pattern is obtained in day three, that means in certain carbon labeling, uh, group, uh, I labeled wrong, it's group three. Group three is much more abundant in by day three, day already, that means, again, without D2 stress, there must be about two days of delay uh, can, uh, can be minimized. But then we look at closely found something interesting that group two, uh, if you are labeling only galactose and uh, 18,3 fatty acid, then 18 plus six, the maximum number of carbon should be 24. But we see, we see group two tailing down to about 27 carbons. So what that means is that there are additional three carbons being labeled probably by glycerol backbone labeling, which we cannot explain from our previous model. Uh, on top of that, if you look at uh, reverse labeling of D2 grown plant going back to H2, uh, we see some similar patterns. So uh, before we move to H2, the average labeling, now they're all labeled about average labeling about uh, 34.5 after growing a uh, couple of months. Uh, it's not exact 35, but it's 34.5. And then now it's reverse labeling back to hydrogen being labeled. So the, the group one is now the backward. The group one has about uh, the labeling difference of 3.5 that is exactly, ma exactly matching the galactose the CH labeling. But then group two, the difference uh, is about 14 point, about 20. And if you have only galactose and fatty acids are labeled, then uh, uh, this difference should be 18. So we have more H bag exchange than uh, bag labeling than we thought. Uh, but if you think glycerol is also labeled, uh, then 20.5. So probably mixed up two, but then uh, there must be more glycerol backbone contributions. So I know it's already getting complicated and uh, we don't know exact answers, but this is our hypothesis at the moment. So what we believe is there are two group two. Uh, so when I say group two it means intermediate kinetics about only about halfway being labeled. We believe there are two pathways of halfway labeling. One which we see in detour labeling that uh, as I explained that LPA uh, as an unlabeled LPA as intermediate then we are labeling uh, butyrum labeled fatty acid and then uh, galactose. But then there must be some other pathway that start from both glycerol backward and fatty acid. So LPA is labeled, but then from the early part of the uh, plant growth, there must be a lot of unlabeled acyl group um, uh, uh, pooled should be available that unlabeled fatty acids are labeling to SN2 positions. And then, uh, so that's another pathway. So they are different by three carbons, uh, the glycerol backbone, and also they are uh, different by SN1 position labeling or SN2 position labeling. So again, hopefully through MSMS, we can confirm whether that's the case. And then uh, this is a certain carbon labeling uh, aspect imaging data and so the similar pattern that we have seen in deuterium labeling that group one is mostly 
the same with uh, unlabeled ones. So again, they suggest that there's a large pool of unlabeled that present in all the tissues. That's not surprising. There's a lot of pieces uh, that can produce unlabeled DAG. But then group three is mostly from new tissues and group two shows some intermediate behavior. So uh, with that, uh, the, our, so this work of in vivo isotope labeling uh, just supported by uh, NSF PGR uh, uh, funding. And then uh, on tissue chemical derivation was uh, funded by CMI. And then our early work of mass spec imaging was funded by DOE through the AIMS lab. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm ready for any questions. Okay, great talk. Uh, thank you. So do we have any questions? Chris? So <clears throat> I was wondering if you guys have had gone and maybe looked at any transcript data or maybe even proteomic data, because I assume at least in those lipid synthesis pathways between, you know, what you were talking about, eukaryotic versus prokaryotic are probably identified and resolved. So eukaryotic and prokaryotic pathways are well established. Uh, I don't believe it's done in dog weight. It's definitely worthwhile. Uh, so the pathway itself is well established, but uh, probably not in dog weight. Okay, yeah, thanks. Any other question from audience here? Uh, okay, here we have one. Yeah, it's it's very interesting how life prefers a, a certain type of atom, and then with all these organic implications that you, you presented, I was wondering whether other properties of the water uh, that that you used were measured, um, like pH. Did that differ between or or nutrient availability? Between the different types of types of uh, substrates, so uh, so we maintain everything else the same. Uh, we use uh, Schenken Hildebrand medium, uh, zero point five x, and I and pH maintained about five point five. I think uh, I don't know whether we uh, traced whether there is any change in pH or others, but. Uh, I don't think, because you, you have there too large volume of medium and there's a tiny bit of a dog weight, I don't think that will affect much. Thank you. Any other question? Kevin has one here. Thanks for that talk, actually. Uh, just had one quick question. Do you see any back labeling within the actual Maldi stores? So when you actually section these duck weeds, and actually store them is there back labeling that occurs throughout the multi process or even within the storage i'm not sure what you're trying to get at uh, we typically process sample right away uh it, we, we don't typically store and then analyze later so the uh, one thing i didn't mention is uh when we uh measured it uh of course OH is in, so I, I talked about only CH hydrogens and OH hydrogen is problematic because some of them can be back exchanged during sample prep. So uh, I, I forgot to mention, but, but uh, before we do any mass spec analysis, we wash off with regular water to back exchange uh, every OH so that to minimize any analytical variations. But CH bond should be strong enough that uh, I don't think. Okay, that makes sense actually, because I know you're doing the gas phase exchange as well, and that yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the yeah, they're different, totally different approaches. Okay, let's. If you have one more time, one question more. I have one, uh, just quick question. Do so. Uh, I didn't just get it. Like, do you think that deuterium water kind of give stress to the plant? So it is. Yeah, it was toxic. It was toxic. For example, for human, if you consume more than 8% for a long time, there's a huge health consequence. 
I was thinking that just that it's kind of maybe that response that you see uh, that's the, because the, different the, chemistry. I know that right. it, it's kinetic, has like it, slower reaction. Yeah, it's then. kinetic isotopy effect. Oh yeah. So so hydrogen uh, can be easily labeled by deuterium with twice yeah. heavier mass. Yeah. Then it's not efficient, yeah. and that 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 has biological consequences at the end.